Welcome everybody to the Bridgman Tuesday lunch series. Um, I'm John Pelfrey. Uh, welcome you here to the Bridgman Center. It's a great uh, crowd we have today and a fun celebratory topic. We're kicking off uh, this fall a uh, series of events to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Bridgman Center. We are 10 years old this academic year, hard to imagine. Um, and so in the spirit of being 10 years old, we want to do both some reflection on what we as a broad community have learned over the last 10 years, but also look to the next decade of um, work in this area. And uh, today's session is um, jointly a celebration of one web day, the brainchild of uh, Professor uh, Susan Crocker, who teaches at Cardozo, and many others in the community, um, as well as a chance to start this process of both reflection and looking, uh, looking ahead. And um, we had um, more than 40 people who are willing to come to lunch today. We have been turning people away, but we're delighted that all of you um, have made it in under the cut. And for those who um, weren't able to join us today, we hope you will another time. Uh, and to all those watching any webcast, uh, welcome to the Virgin Center. One of the things that's key to our 10th anniversary of the Virgin Center is seeking to reach out to other schools at the university and try to bring in so many people. So here in the design school and education school and um, computer scientists and so forth, it's just a great and happy thing. Um, and a good way to start this off. So, the um, Lord's Berkman Fellows slash faculty will um, introduce the topic of the future of the internet. Um, Jonathan has a book coming out on this. He will, um, that's why he gets to go last. Uh, but uh, Jean, then, uh, oh, Wendy, then Jean, then uh, Judith. So maybe Wendy sells your All right, thank you. Thanks very much. And um, I'm going to start by uh, being a bit disruptive to the subject here because David and John asked me to speak about uh, the future of the internet uh, and I demurred because I'm not a very good futurist <laughs> and plus I think that the present of the internet is much more exciting than uh, any particular future that I could predict. Plus, as a law uh, professor, you know about quarreling with the hypothetical and then you start out <laughs> <laughs> um, Because I think at the present we could say we're at the point of a light cone of lots of possible futures of what could happen with the internet. And if we're forced to cho choose one of those futures, uh, we set ourselves down a course uh, in that direction that closes off lots of other exciting possibilities uh, in those other uh, possible directions. And I don't want to have to choose between uh, a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where individuals can offer up the uh, things that they've discovered in their attic or the things that they've built uh, and a commercial marketplace where uh, a big commercial really polished uh, emporium uh, offering uh, the goods online that they had previously offered offline. Uh, the eBay or the Barnes and Noble dot com uh, choice. I don't want to choose between professionally produced music uh, and offered in uh, professionally packaged downloads and the individual singer songwriters who uh, go and find collaborators online and independent uh, production companies that spring up uh, to offer their wares there. I don't want to choose between journalism as produced by the New York Times and journalism uh, as produced by those the Times might have referred to uh, as its dear readers uh, just a few years ago. And if 10 years ago we had been asked to make uh, this same sort of uh, prediction about what the net would look like now, uh, would we have predicted that uh, typing a query into a bar in our web browsers would bring up uh, nearly always a good answer to that query, uh, and then that, that, that good answer would be uh, produced not by the top-down coordination of a World Book or a Encarta or a Britannica, uh, but by uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals typing in their own self-interest into web logs and uh, web bulletin boards and answer forums and even sometimes going and uh, editing an online encyclopedia to uh, reflect their interests and subjects of expertise. Uh, we have predicted uh, the takeoff of social networking sites, the, uh, the current darling Facebook developed uh, out of a dorm room here. We have predicted the, the sharing of, uh, of photos and travel and likes and hates and loves uh, based on what we individually wanted to uh, to share with friends and not necessarily uh, based on what marketers wanted us to uh, help to elaborate their product offerings. 
Uh, would we have predicted that the biggest and currently most successful video sharing site uh, would have been developed not by the uh, current leader in uh, portals or in uh, text search, which was trying very hard, of course, Google, to develop its own video, uh, but by a few unknowns uh, working uh, jointly uh, with the, the new tools that were out there available to all of us uh, to develop something that eventually Google bought because it couldn't produce in-house uh, something that was equally good. Uh, and if we were trying to regulate based on our years ago predictions, would we have left the, the network open to uh, these user-driven innovations? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid we wouldn't have, and I want to warn us against uh, that kind of, kind of single future thinking regulation today. Uh, because the beauty of the network today uh, has been that it's allowed the unplanned development, because the tools are cheap, college, college kids in their dorm rooms uh, can build products uh, and services that compete with uh, the college dropouts formed companies of uh, a, d a decade or generation earlier um, because the connectivity is cheap they can network in collaborators and uh, collaborate and co-develop with the users of their software uh, and services because they don't need permission from any central regulator uh, they can launch sites that compete with established business models. They don't need to have a business model uh, that they can present to a regulator before they, uh, they launch their sites and tools. Uh, and sure, I'm sure Jonathan uh, will talk about the, the spammers and scammers and other problems that this uh, unregulated network uh, allows to proliferate, but the network uh, and the offline world have, have also been helping us to develop the tools to fight those. Uh, and I think there too, rather than try to predict all of the evils, uh, we should plan for, for the openness that allows us to self-generate the tools to, uh, to help ourselves to fight them. And so, um, as I said, I'm, I'm not trying to, to predict any particular uh, future, but to uh, to make us think of all of the possibilities that are just germinating now uh, and to continue to regulate this space with the light touch that will allow today's users to become uh, tomorrow's innovators and co-developers of the net. Wendy, thank you. Um, thank as you. As we're doing questions, I think what we'll do is just keep plowing ahead with the different um, commentators and then go back uh, to the discussion after that. One just uh, rhetorical question. I wonder if 10 years ago you would have said roughly speaking the same thing when you were here as a, one of the first students at Berkeley Center. I think the answer is you might be able to back to that, which is um, we should leave open opportunities. And that's a strong normative statement, effectively, about what the future ought to be, if not. Yes, well, I think that that was one of the first things I learned coming into the Berkman Center 10 years ago. I'm seeing openness uh, in so many different places throughout the mission. Uh, Gene Koo, Bergman Fellow, is someone working on a slightly different set of topics. Unfortunately, I saw him nodding a lot. I think the internet will become increasingly important in supporting and sustaining our civic communities. And I believe that 3D virtual worlds are illustrating how technology will help make that happen. And online games, in particular, within those worlds, uh, suggest a shape of what a future civic life might look like. And I came to the internet later than a lot of the people who are affiliated with the Berkman Center uh, during the heyday of web-based forums about, you know, 1999-2000. And there I found rich communities and I made deep friendships. And a lot of my non-virtual friends found those relationships puzzling, maybe even troubling. And today we see that same dichotomy between acceptance and rejection of 3D worlds as real or not real. But the trend, I think, is towards assimilating a larger and larger percentage of the population with each technological breakthrough, whether it's 3D virtualization, whether it's in Second Life or Half-Life, or kinetic motion, like the, like the Nintendo Wii, or something that hasn't even been thought up yet, except maybe at the media lab down, down the street from us. Um, and traditionalists worry that this kind of assimilation will destroy our existing civic life, and on the flip side, net utopians actually look forward to that destruction. Um, but I think Yohai Benkler is right to find the middle ground between the two positions, that virtual networks often extend rather than replace our physical networks. 
my colleague Eric Gordon at Emerson calls this embrace net locality. And it's what you do every time you pick up your cell phone and you ask, where are you? Because we're still grounded in the physical reality even as we're also projecting into the virtual one. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, computer game, that the computer game industry is advancing many of the technologies and the techniques that are making all this happen. Games are about engagement. And it turns out that what engages human beings most is really other people. And game developers are figuring out how to get people to form teams and achieve goals together. And corporate managers are taking notes. And those of us who care about civic and political engagement should take notes too. Robert Putnam worried about people who are bowling alone. Anyone who's seen World of Warcraft would stop worrying about whether the internet can build social capital, I think it can, and instead wonder how is it going to help us to spend that capital. And I see two future worlds. In one, we have the matrix. Virtual worlds become the new opiate of the disempowered masses. And we emigrate, as Ted Kashanova puts it, and never look back. And in the other, we have what Beth Novick calls democracy the video game. Our institutions of work and governance <coughs> learn from and adapt to the technologies we play. And in that vision of the future, virtual worlds allow us to enhance and make more meaningful our relationships to our employers, to our governments, and most of all, to each other. Thank you. I can't wait to hear what Carrie and the good team have to say on this for sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, you referenced Jane the MIT Media Lab. She was doing a um, here she is. Here is the MIT Media Lab. She was, but my secret <coughs> desire is that, that at the end of the year you will not refer to yourself as a professor of media lab first than you can tell a second, but rather the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> you will report me Berkman fellow and later. Those are the significance of the final point. But um, so I know you're hoping we would all disagree, but I'll start by saying that what I also wanted to talk about is how much what people really want to see is other people. And what I was thinking about when I was asked to talk about this is what happens with search, when search really becomes about people. You know, what, we're starting to see the beginnings now of intelligent searches, where your results look different when it, what you're searching for is a address. You get a map. If you're searching for something to buy, you get a list of stores. So there's beginning to be some intelligence that said, Looking at the type of thing you're searching for changes the type of form we put the results in. And I started thinking, well, you know, a lot of what people are looking for, if you look at you know, Google's list of the top name things, it's all names. It's names of people in the news, and somebody's friend, and, you know, it's all kinds of things like that. So what does search end up like when Google or some other company says, okay, we're going to think about how to specialize your results for a person. And let's think about this in a couple of different contexts. Because one, part of it is right now, you know, as Wendy said, you know, 10 years ago, would you have really expected all the useful information that's up there? And I'd like you to think about what are the things that we don't expect to find out about someone when we put their name into Google now, but in 10 years it might be possible because 10 years ago, there were no social networking sites. People weren't writing every single thing they did at a party last night. They're not discussing the details of their miscarriage on a blog. But that stuff is all out there right now. And so when you start to think about in 10 years, we'll have you know, a couple of generations of people who've grown up with the idea that while you can put everything into places that you think of maybe as private, some of them are clearly public and they just hadn't really thought about them as public, and some are places that maybe they're private today. But what, you know, what happens when everyone moves on from Facebook? and it goes out of business. It's part of the fire sale, all that information. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe like a company that will put it all up will be the ones that will help them bail out their creditors. Who knows? So a lot of this information is going to be increasingly out there. You walked into this room today and you were told, okay, this is being webcast. Isn't Everything that fun? You say. <laughs> <laughs> it's online. It's all part of your permanent record. Now, but think how, you know, think how fascinating it is. And then we ask you to introduce themselves by <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So here's your name. It's all very clear who you are and that you were in this room on this day, on this place, and you're nodding, which is this, or you're disagreeing with something else. And so when a search engine comes up, they can take all these little bits of information, the fact that your name is linked to how much you paid for your house. And when you come up with this portrait, I mean, it's going to be an amazing place. It really is going to be much more so than perhaps they see. Um, 3D graphical world, a real second life, where the types of things you might be able to feel and see about other people, by seeing them walk down the street, 
is going to seem kind of a pale shadow of the richness of what you can get to know about someone by Googling their name. But what are some, of, some of the things we need to think about, perhaps on the positive side, is, you know, in some good ways, is how to make this happen. It's a fascinating world where what will come up is this amazing data portrait, perhaps with some temporal elements. You can see the patterns and what people have said. You can get to all their conversations. You can know, you know, all the things they said, their level of activities. You can see because of all the social networks they've been in. You can get links to all their friends. You can see them in this extraordinarily rich context. But that also gives us another perspective for thinking about how we want to see privacy, how we want to make people think about where their information is going. When we think about what I think is the inevitability of this kind of beautiful, rich data portrait, how do we want to see whether it's regulation of privacy, how we want to think about the use of names, the use of anonymity, what are the things you really find a way when you join a website, what, what are the things we want to think about, whether they're technological or social solutions for expiring information about people, for even better understanding of what information is significant, what's true, what are the things that this person has agreed are valid, what are the things that they dispute, is there a personal Wikipedia where you can have a discussion page of all the things that have ever been said about you. So that was my um, reaction to thinking about the future of the web is a question about what is the future of what will people look like on the web. So, thank you. So, Jonathan, are you there? I am here. All right, so here are your marching orders. In five minutes, you have to accomplish three things. Um, one is to talk about the book that you've spent several years writing. <laughs> Crystallize that. Secondly, tie together the disparate threads of three people you've just heard. And third, be sure to disagree. Create some dynamic tension out of which conversation will flow in this room. <coughs> okay, then. <laughs> Go. Uh, Where I are you, by the way? I come from cyberspace, the new home of mine. <laughs> the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. Oh, I'm sorry, that's John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which, while written ten years ago, seems to fit the bill pretty well. My sense is that we live in a time of fashion and fear. Uh, fashion is the wonderful set of ads for the iPod of those silhouettes, completely faceless people dancing around, but looking so much cooler than you sitting on the couch, not dancing around, watching them on your television. Um, fashion is an expression of your identity, but as we understand fashion today, it's kind of a superficial expression. It's like, do you want a blue iPod or a red iPod? Thank you very much. I did it in your honor, John. <laughs> um, and in that sense, fashion is kind of giving your proxy away to some other entity that's going to help you decide what's cool and what's not. That's the prevailing mode of fashion right now. We gather in Milan or New York, or we read the newspaper that tells us about the gatherings there as to what's cool and what's not and what we should rush out and buy. The other element that seems to be running around today is fear. Um, we live in a time where we're scared that at any moment really bad people with whom we have nothing in common and only want to uh, hurt us and who hate us for our freedoms uh, are perhaps garnering the tools to actually hurt us and make our lives very difficult. And I think that fear also tends to have us give our proxies away, to ask people with expertise, with power, and a position different from ours to take responsibility for making us safe. And I'm concerned that these two uh, phenomena of fashion and fear can be leading to trouble. Um, when Tim Berners-Lee was designing the net, he said at one point, uh, the web that is, um, he was thinking of building into HTTP protocol a way of saying if you couldn't get to a server, because back in 1993 or 94 servers weren't that reliably accessible, you could ask nearby computers on your net, by the way, has anybody re visibly, uh, recently visited this server? And if so, uh, do you have the page I'm trying to get? That was almost built into just background HTTP. And then he never got around to it. And it turned out not to be all that necessary because servers were very accessible. It's funny now that as servers become inaccessible due to filtering and other blockages, 
uh, it would have been nice to have had that feature all along. And it kind of emphasizes just how much our network architecture actually affects how much a response to fear could change the internet that we have. And I'm a little bit sad that the internet that apocryphally is said to be nuclear war resistant, uh, and that was one of its motives, although why anybody would want to check email after a nuclear war is not clear to me, um, is in fact not. That the kinds of technologies like peer-to-peer -peer have ended up being used for purposes in the public eye and demonized such that they're not developing so quickly. And Web 2.0 is very much of the let's pick a server and access it model. Um, and that means that should there come a moment when somebody wants to shut down the party that the previous colleagues are so excited about, it actually, to me, would not be that hard a thing to do. They've said famously that society is nine meals away from total collapse. Anybody that hasn't eaten for three days is ready to pretty much do anything to get a happy meal. And I wonder how many downed servers we are away from actually depriving ourselves of the net as we know it. From genes, payons to online games and such, that's just one server. The entire world of Warcraft is yankable with one plug. Um, calls to mind the South Park episode on the subject in which the grave executives at Blizzard Software look at each other and say, this could be the end of the world of Warcraft as we know it. Um, Wendy's talk appeared to be, if I may summarize in five seconds, the enemy is big media, but we don't have to kill it, we just have to compete with it on a level playing field. But even there, that boils down to elements of net architecture, because Wendy's chosen means of competing is to have teenagers in dorm rooms cooking up new stuff that's really compelling to each other and eventually to us. And our net architecture that allows that right now, I worry, is falling victim to fashion, appliancization, and fear, the kinds of uh, lockdown we would see if the internet is used as an instrument of disruption by people who are really out to get us. Finally, Judith told us about the link between fashion and fear, that as we blog about everything and do it as expressions of our identity, of our identities, the way that fashion is, we could come later to regret it and not really know how to pull back a little bit, offer less than we mean to in a way to keep a private sphere. And so I offer that a creative tension between the ideals of the digital preservationists, Stuart Schieber is among us and has been thinking a lot about that, who are looking at decades and centuries as to how to preserve our content, our data, our texts. I think we, in a way, owe ourselves to think through net architecture in a way that's meant to preserve our ability to innovate for decades and centuries, not just for a little while. And yet, Judith reminds us that it's not just digital preservation, it's digital retraction and digital deletion, how to actually maintain some level of control over the net so that we preserve our identities, even as we preserve the net itself. I hit all three themes, and people will still buy the book because you didn't give away the last time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so thank you to the four of you. Um, it was a great set of provocations. Um, dynamic defense, I think, is how you've left it. Uh, but I suspect others have comments on this. Hey, Doc, since you are a founder of One Web Day, would you like the job of going first? Whoa. Um, well, geez, where to begin? You know, it's, it, I don't know, I, what I would visit is, is simply the, um, and this is in the spirit of one web day rather than a, the sort of debate that you've set up here, but um, uh, as, as a matter of appreciation of where we are now, which is actually the idea behind one web day. Um, if it weren't, for, I mean, of course we could say if it weren't for the web, none of us would be here, I suppose, but um, I, I certainly wouldn't be here. I, you know, I might just be another um, close to retirement marketing guy who still did some writing on the side. Um, when the web came along in the mid '90s, which is something I saw coming, and when I first heard about it in the early '90s, um, uh, I looked at it as a, a kind of salvation for somebody whose writing did not fit any particular mold. Um, 
I failed to sell my writing to pretty much every PC magazine that was out there. Even though it was, well, your writing is really good, but I couldn't sell it. Um, uh, eventually, Linux Journal approached me. I knew nothing about Linux, but um, I wrote about everything that Linux touched, which was mostly connected on the web. And and I've had you know a hell of a time just thinking out loud about things that the web touches, and especially the web itself. And and I, I have to say, I go back and forth, and I'm getting over to the, the debate point and where we're going in the future, between between the dystopian model of all the things that are going to go to hell and how the bad guys are going to be out to get us and so forth, and and the idealistic, almost utopian model, which I think it is utopian, except we happen to live in utopia. So we've already gotten there, as far as I'm concerned. So how do we keep utopia? That's kind of a that's kind of a taller order than making one, I think, in some ways, because we sort of stumbled into it, and now we're thinking about what it is, what are the what are the core values, what are the core architectural um, natures of this thing. What is it about us, speaking to, to Jonathan's point uh, about generativity, that that sustains this place? What is it that we each bring to it personally that make all of us more valuable and all of us that we contribute more valuable? Um, I'm, I'm even fascinated by what the fact of the web in our midst does to definitions of things like, uh, of, of words like information, which for the longest time um, we treat it as a something static. Information is something that you put into a server or something. But, but in fact, it's and this is this comes out of a conversation I had with Tim O'Reilly years ago about the problem both of us had with the term information, which is that we have this static idea about it, and yet it's derived from the verb to inform, which is derived from the verb to form, which is what we do when we hear each other. It's what we do when we learn from each other. We are. We are all, in either Tim's words or mine, I forget whose it was, we are all authors of each other. Um, we are all changing constantly. So, um, uh, to address Judah's point, um, how, how do you follow that? It isn't just an avatar walking through the world. It isn't just a history. It's what we do to and with each other that is profoundly human and yet very, very hard to describe or to nail down. So anyway, that's just sort of a, a general appreciation of where we are right now, which I'm, I feel very privileged and lucky to be part of. I keep looking at Andy, because Andy's written a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> I want, and I see he's here, and I feel lucky that he's here. Uh, when you were talking, I was thinking of Marshall McLuhan. And at one point I thought, after all, he was a big guy in the, in the 70s, and, and a lot of people were talking about him, and he was totally incoherent. I was trying to think if I could apply anything of what he said to the web. And um, I didn't find anything that much new. But he talked about hot media and cool media. Hot media give you everything you need so they envelop you and you don't have to, um, you don't have to think. And cool media let you put something in between. So the internet is definitely a cool medium because now you can post uh, an answer to any news article. And you can go and you can also take things and remash them and mix them up. So we distance ourselves from information, from from content. So um, we have more control now. Since we're on this theme of information that's been introduced, and Jonathan, um, I think, threw out a provocation to Stuart Schieber, and we also have um, Terry Martin here, who has just recently uh, announced his retirement after 27 years of being the Harvard Law School library, and quite a run, um, two leading preservationists in our midst. Um, and I wonder if I might put either or both of you on the spot in response to John. Well, so, I mean, it's a little tricky because um, much of the very concrete work I've done on long-term preservation of, um, I guess you could call it information, it's scholarly articles. Some of those contain information, others don't, but we just <laughs> preserve them all on the off chance that uh, in the long run we'll be able to figure out which is which. We'll ask you later which is which. <laughs> um, to a certain extent, uh, the methods that I've proposed, granted for the short to medium, to medium term, have been a bit Luddite. So, for instance, because there are these problems uh, with our utopian 
or dystopian, I'm not sure, depending on who you ask the present, uh, because it's not clear what's going to happen in o over the decades uh, in terms of preserving all this digital material, there's a, there's a worry that uh, we could be creating the uh, modern equivalent of the Library of Alexandria by publishing all of our journals online. And so the, the alternative that I've proposed and in fact been helping to implement is this, this kind of, uh, it may sound kind of backwards, but to use the one mechanism we know to preserve data, namely acid-free paper, to preserve all of these online journals. So it sounds a little silly, but that's the best method I know of for preserving scholarly articles is to print them out and put them in a library. <laughs> I remember that. So on the one hand, there's this worry. I mean, it's a, it's a very strange situation. On the one hand, there's this worry that the web won't be around long enough to be an archival medium in the sense that librarians mean an archival medium. So we need to resort to these prior technologies. And on the other hand, there's Judith's worry that the information is going to be around so long, and it's so difficult to, to, to get rid of this stuff, that we're going to have uh, this kind of dystopian situation where every accidental thing that you ever do that happens to get caught will be available for anyone to peruse and take advantage of uh, in the long term. And I'm not sure how those two, uh, how those two worries can both coexist since they seem to be contradictory, but somehow they're both true. Okay, that's part of it. So Judith wants to go next, but I think for John's purposes and others, um, we've been joined by our friend Charlie Nesson has come to the back of the room, and um, none of this would have happened, but for Charlie's uh, inspiration with Dorothy Zinberg and others um, more than 10 years ago to be sure. So welcome, Charlie. Well, thank you very much, John, but I haven't tuned in enough on the conversation. You're not, you're not on the spot yet. And I just wanted Jonathan who's out there to know <laughs> oh. that you were back Hello, there. Hello, Jonathan. Oh, he can't, you see, he can't quite see you. <laughs> I see, it looks to be a turtleneck. <laughs> so this would be quick, but this is somewhat bringing together the themes of fashion and fair and information, because I'm also very interested in fashion, and I think there's a very strong relationship between fashion and information, and one of the things that fashion does is it's this constant demand, I look at things in terms of signals, you know, if, if you're trying to signal that I am cool, you have to... The thing that you are signaling, I'm cool, or I am a company like IBM that's in the forefront of everything, you still have to keep changing how you do it. So if you're a person dressing, the type of clothes you have to wear have to keep changing. If you're a company like IBM, two years ago you had to like social networks, and this year you have to like second life. So there's fashions in everything. But one of the things being in the forefront of fashion is about, is about dealing with fear, because it involves taking risks. You know, for all of you computer programmers, you know that when you decide to use a new language you know, the week it's released, you will spend enormous amount of time learning a language which is then either going to be obsolete or you're going to be the one debugging it. So the, that cutting edge of fashion always involves a tremendous amount of risk. As humans, I think we have an innate fear of change, but we're living in a society that changes at an unprecedented rate. And the net and the web are doing a huge amount to accelerate that. And so I think there's a very important relationship. And while fashion may seem frivolous, it is this external sign of willingness to change, willingness to constantly adapt, that you're willing to give up something that was comfortable that you knew and just constantly reinvent how you do things, what you do. Whether this is good or bad, again, yeah, this is another one of these dystopic utopic versions. Um, Right yeah, we <laughs> just be voting whether these are good or bad. But I think one of the things about the net is the fantastic rate of change that it enforces on everybody. And I think what we are just at the beginning of understanding is what does it mean to live in a culture in which there is this level of constant change and constant learning. So that's the fashion relationship. And so fashion may be a signal of your willingness to adapt and why once we reach a certain age, we start Terry Martin, you led the Harvard Law School by the world's greatest collection.
collection of uh, books at this moment have um, changed, and with lots of fashion swirling around you. Um, do you agree with Sir and Jonathan and look at it? No, I, I think the future is clearly digital. I just wanted to say something about fashion, though. The best thing about fashion is it can't be copyrighted. Terry uh, Fisher will explain why that, why that hasn't made um, Armani poverty stricken, but he's managed to do okay. But, um, I mean, Stewart is correct in that we, we know how to preserve paper better than we know how to preserve digital stuff. I mean, so there's a lot of experiments with digital preservation. Uh, MIT has their big D space initiative, which means they go and they capture it and they put it on the computer someplace. And if somebody wants it at some point in the future, they will figure out how to get it out of the computer and display it for you. But they'll do it then. Harvard has a different approach in that it, it, it defines a, 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 a number of formats in which you can deposit digital objects. We'll take a PDF because we know what a PDF is, and if there's something better than a PDF in the future, we can figure out how to convert current PDFs into something else. Um, neither one of those is probably going to be perfect. I, I, I know DSpace is going to get some little stash of data that they won't in 20 years be able to figure out. And um, Harvard isn't going to be collecting some stuff because it doesn't fit one of their defined format. So we'll lose, we'll lose stuff. But, um, but it's not really economically possible to convert all the digital information into some kind of printed form. Um, and, and you'd miss a lot. Take something that's three dimensional and make it two dimensional. So the world is going to be digital. And, you know, librarians are struggling with you know, how, how to do that. And so we're, we're just knocking off the little pieces of it a bit of a time. We've got the Stanford approach, which is basically to throw it out onto the world. They have their approach called locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. So they just find a dozen people willing to, on their own little server, Back up some scholarly journal. This is this. You can understand why somebody who sits on an earthquake call. That's Jonathan. Are you on an earthquake call no, right no. now? <laughs> Shake around a little. A big, very large hole right outside. Of the I'm not sure why. It feels a little earthquake here. Jonathan, before we go to Dorothy, do you want to respond to any of these comments? No, no, let's uh, keep going. Yeah, um, if I could, I'd like to add a personal note and a somewhat different tack. Uh, I had 10 years at Harvard Medical School in biochemistry and then got very interested in sort of the social psychology and politics of science. And in the 60s was what was then known as the head section man for Eric Erickson at Harvard, who was then the big man on campus and a psychoanalyst of some distinction. And now I serve on a committee uh, that is thinking through where would a mind like Erickson's be today. And one of the questions I had, Jonathan, this goes back to something you raised on uh, how do we preserve our identities. And I was thinking of social psychological identities because if you look back to the 60s, I think it was the beginning of when parents were no longer the only transmitter of values and the culture, that the peer culture began to take over. Now you've got the net and the difference between where the parents are by and large and where younger people are. And what I brought up at the Erickson Institute is how does one think about identity between a therapist and a patient or client when the therapist inhabits one world of thinking and the client, younger client, another. And does this make a difference? 
and even though therapists, we assume, will always be somewhat older than the patient, uh, is hip about what's going on in, in the net, does the fact that the client has been brought up on this as reality and the first reference, I mean, I was just thinking today, why don't I remember to bring my laptop with me? It just, it's so, I keep meaning to, but I simply never do. And everything I do on this is learned. It's not automatic. And so I guess what I would love to see this group, someone somewhere in this group begin to think through, is uh, what's the impact on cognition? And- I think have at least four or five people working on that problem the table. So yeah. very, about 10 years ago, I began to notice that my students thought very differently from me. We may have gotten to the same answers, but we got there by a different route. And it's understanding that... You knew the answer and they Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A very, very different kind of approach. And uh, I, again, Jonathan, when you were speaking, I had a thought I had not had in many decades, which was when I was in young part of grammar school had a wonderful teacher, a woman, when we were learning about the Gettysburg Address, she said, the words never go away, and Abraham Lincoln's words are still out there, and someday we're going to know how to get them back. And I feel that that's where I am now, that people are working in a way of pulling out uh, what we always thought had disappeared, but it's there. Thank you. So, um, Before you call on the professional sociologist, George? I wasn't quite yet, but anyway, you go ahead. Yeah, I was a pop psychologist from Stanford. Well, it just to me, it calls to mind uh, Charlie's observation from the very beginning, you know, cyberspace is a rhetorical space, and it's a place where you fix a message, and you have to understand it as a message. And I think it's right for Dorothy to ask, what is the message or the set of messages that our kids get? now that they plug in like to something like Club Penguin so early and learning about uh, what's out there on the network. And I, I fear that the kind of cyber crypto libertarians among us don't really think that through too much. It's just, hey, it's our job just to keep the tumbleweeds going through the middle of the western town and everybody with a holster that has a good six shooter in it and everything else will sort itself out. And of course, I don't think the quote unquote sort of family values people who are just terrified of any form of thinking that isn't mainstream, really have figured this out either. I, I, it, it calls to mind to me uh, something Andrew Solomon actually just pointed out in his blog. Um, there was a video posted on YouTube of uh, some very young woman who'd been asked to sing the Star Spangled Banner at like an NBA playoff game or something, and she forgot the words in the first verse. and. I mean, you know, it's a pretty high-stress situation. She's forgotten the words. People are sort of laughing and kind of the way when a bunch of dishes fall at the dining hall, people sort of applaud a little bit. And then a coach of one of the teams comes over and stands next to her and starts the song again with her, singing along with her. And then the entire audience starts singing with her too. And by the end, it's like, you know, tears are streaming down everybody's face as we celebrate how great America is. Um, but the thing that, the, the reason I thought of this right now is because there's an example of a viral video that isn't the normal punchline of, somebody screwed up, I'm so glad it wasn't me, check this out. <laughs> kind of has an element of social cruelty to it, and as Homer Simpson would say, it's funny because I don't know him. Um, and trying to figure out how to structure the environment so the messages that bounce around aren't just the capability we have to laugh at each other in a cruel way, but to celebrate each other. I want to pursue, at least briefly, this idea of identity that has circulated in many of the comments thus far. Uh, you might think of a, a, a feudal state of affairs as one in which um, work, home, and play are integrated, do all in the same place and with more or less the same people, and you very rarely move in your life. And those conditions uh, conduce to an extremely stable, integrated sense of 
and projection of self. Uh, everybody knows you and knows you in all guises in your town. And the, well, among the features of modernity, carried to its extreme in the United States, is, is the fragmentation of each of those conditions. So work, home, and play are, are differentiated, and they come to be engaged in, in different places with different people. And, and moreover, uh, people m move, move homes, move jobs, move um, uh, avocations radically in the course of their little lives. And what this <coughs> facilitates is a fragmentation on the one hand of community, no surprise there, but also a fragmentation of identity in which you can be different people in different settings and different people at different <coughs> moments over time. And a state of affairs that a postmodern theory celebrates, other people lament. So one, so here's the hypothesis, is that um, in some ways the technology of which we are concerned is uh, corroding the conditions of modernity and returning us to a feudal state of affairs in that once again uh, work, play, and home are coming together. People work from home and, and they merge their, like how many people here use different emails for their for their personal stuff and their work stuff. Probably not many. Most of us have an email, a primary email address, and we integrate across them. And you work when you get up in the morning and you play in the middle of the day. It's sort of swirled together. And then the preservation information that Jonathan um, and Judith were emphasizing is uh, corroding the capacity to remake yourself over time, remake yourself afresh over time. Uh, you are um, all, all continuously aware of your past, and other people are continuously aware of your past, and we have a projection of the future. So, weirdly, those are the conditions of, of feudalism and stable identity, uh, now on a global scale rather than a village scale. So, are we going to abandon the a fragmentation of self that uh, was a condition of modernity? Um, it's possible. But so here's the hypothesis. Despite the, the return of conditions that led to the stable self in, say, the 15th century, uh, we can't go back on this front. And we're going to have to, we already are, accepting a degree of fragmentation in the new environment um, that is some, and is in some tension with its sociological and technological conditions. And maybe we want to go further and to facilitate it, like Jonathan's idea. I don't know whether it's still in the draft of the book of the uh, of um, identity bankruptcy when you decide to wipe the slate clean of your uh, accumulated reputation and um, and start over again. It'd be one conceivable way of uh, achieving this. Another uh, form might come to pass in politics. So to go back to Gene's theory about where this is going to go for civic life, so we have accepted in most democracies, certainly in the United States, for about a century, a historian sometimes referred to as the Victorian Compromise, in which we tolerate a whole lot of um, oddity in behavior, as long as it's private. But what we insist upon is a as a well-scrubbed public face. And, and what blows up a, a politician's career is the, is the revelation in public of what we have compelled to remain private, whether it's Bill Clinton's behavior or whatever. And uh, that may not be possible soon, that our access to all the information over time of every per person's life may compel us to accept um, fragmented, imperfect selves in the political arena as we increasingly are obliged to do so in the private arena and to um, abandon our, um, our puritanical insistence upon the well-scrubbed face in politics as well as in private life.
just some hypotheses. For those who don't know, the Project Zero efforts in this area, the project for Howard Gardner and Carrie and others are doing, they have a wonderful um, white paper already on this topic, which addresses Terry's identity segments. One of the few pages of an interesting conversation. Professor Goodman. Well, I, I have a question I pose to those who know rather more about all this than I do. That is one of the things that, that I would think might be happening in the, the next 10 years on the web is that it may be um, uh, contributing to the rapid demise of a text-based intellectual society. Um, um, I expect there are people who have thought about this, but, but uh, the, the library discussion was all around text. And, and uh, at least among my children's age, text is, is, is um, uh, going away. Uh, and one of the things that the web makes possible is the exchange of, of, in, of information and all kinds of things in ways that are, are, are no longer uh, primarily text-based. The whole identity issues and then, you know, what's the next step from texting because I think that gets around the fact that the net might be omnipresent in us, you know, because we're talking about, like, um, embeds of chips and, you know, government initiatives to be able to identify you anywhere at any time. And, you know, where do you take that when they can find you? Well, not they can find you, that sounds apparent. But, you know, when your information is available all the time to anyone, and you're, compu you're communicating in ways that go beyond simple texting, um, do you then, you know, have that break between people who are Luddites who decide to completely drop out of the system and the people who have basically rolled over for the benefits that are conferred by, say, identity 2.0, your ability to, you know, move through the system, completely identify because you're a person who never would mind. Sort of the flip side of it, what's the impact on identity when we, say, do such a such a wide range of activities using a fairly limited number of, say, interface widgets, for lack of a better term. So we, you know, use interface widgets to, like, do our food shopping or buy a book on Amazon or, you know, do consumers' activities, and we also use those same widgets to express love and express our deepest emotions. And that's sort of, it's, 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 it's sort of the opposite of the fragmentation that's being discussed. It's more of a, you know, every kind of emotional activity becomes one kind of formal activity and I, I guess that's just another thing that I've and obviously the 3D world and other all kinds of new interfaces but that put that put that into question but there's still the mouse and the keyboard and the and the like five or six L interface widgets that exist in HTML and kind of you know they've been made prettier over the years but they haven't really changed fundamentally and we live our whole lives through drop down boxes text scrolls, buttons, and radio boxes, and what, you know, I just, I kind of wonder how, well, those are going to change, certainly, but I, I wonder what, wonder what the implications of that are, anyway. So, ostensibly, my brief talk was about virtual worlds, but I think, as I'm listening to this conversation, another contrast between what isn't really between virtual and worlds, or, or 3D technology and graphics, or text, but rather, I hear a lot about identity and individual identity. And what I think I was trying to also convey is the contrast between that and group identity and coming, having groups come together. And so I come at the question of the identity issue from the perspective of you, you, how does that help us come together as groups? How do we find our common interests and how do we, for political or civic organizing purposes, like find the commonality across our identities so that we can come together as groups of people? So I, to some extent, I, I would. I'm interested in, in hearing discussion at the level of groups coming together, which is what's interesting to me about Facebook and all the social networking sites, as opposed to just simply looking at only individual privacy or individual identity or individual uh, movement, movement from text to other digital forms of, uh, of information uh, to, to say one of the, the components at the heart of lots of the excitement that I was trying to describe uh, was the ability to mash up information that we find. And so far, it's been easiest to do that with text. And, and so lots of the coolest things that we see are text analyses and combinations of text or easier numerical data from uh, multiple sites and multiple sources. Uh, so there are possibilities both cool and uh, somewhat disturbing uh, as that mashup ability is carried over into new streams of data. What happens when videos of us can be annotated to, to note where it is that we have been in both our online and offline 
travels, uh, possibly without our permission or uh, consent to, to those kinds of monitoring, what happens when our uh, voice and our vital signs can be uh, added into that picture, uh, and what can we do if it's not um, granting ownership of that data and regulating it from that direction to, to reach toward fair ways of dealing with data that, that has that shared ownership and shared interests in it. Thoughts about the next 10 years, as I <coughs> thought about it, are pretty much the same as they were the last 10 years, and in some way they proved out over the last 10 years, and I expect them to prove out more. It's, um, <coughs> the essence of the environment is, as John puts it, a rhetorical space, a communication space, an open network, and it challenges at both the individual and the institutional level. Uh, at the individual level, I feel we're all in the posture of having to live in a more open environment and coming tuned into it, getting used to the idea that privacy has really changed and maybe Scott was right in 1992 when he said it's dead. At the same time, uh, it's obviously not, but it sure is on the move and has been. And so I, for example, have felt comfortable having the SIG on my email state explicitly that my email is subject to be public. And if someone wants it and expects it to be private with me, let me know, rather than working the default the other way around. And I feel in some way that that's expressive of our, our life to a much greater extent. And Individually, it challenges you to live a more integrated life. Uh, I was always told by Fred Friendly, who was my mentor, tell the truth, it's the easiest to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of having the truth be the same in all your lives and possibly exposed in all your lives is a personal challenge. In, in some way, life becomes easier if you can live it in many separate spaces at the very same time that managing those spaces get hard. And then at an institutional level, it has struck me from the beginning that what's happened is we're, we've moved into an environment in which transaction costs of connection have dropped to a point where it's no longer a function of capital. This was a totally open environment. Nobody filled it to begin with. We didn't understand what the potential was but you could understand that the potential lay in connection. And when we see something like Wikipedia, we see that there are new forms of organism that are possible that aggregate huge amounts of collective energy. And they're inventions. These are actually conceptual inventions. And they aggregate power. I believe over the next 10 years that we will see increasing innovation in the ways in which we aggregate collective power through the net. And I'm optimistic about it because I've always felt that it was it's actually easier to aggregate goodwill than it is to aggregate evil. And so in some sense in the grand battle of good and evil, I feel I feel there's a certain divinity in the net. I feel we're on the right side. Um, so I'm what I'm looking for myself in the next 10 years is, I'd say, a solid business plan for the open net, a way in which the people who and institutions who benefit from the open net come increasingly to see the open net as a source of benefit and participate in structures for supporting it and protecting it against the forces which would disaggregate it. I'm, I'm very hopeful that that's the direction in which we're moving. Charlie, awesome. What a great, great way to end. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here.